Hello, 405. Welcome to Lab 6, Body Composition, Part 2. So for this lab this week, the objective is to do the analysis of all the body composition tests that we did using the body pod, the skin folds, the aim body, and also do the analysis of the circumference measurements and create a goal for our client, our lab partner. We'll also be going to do the hydrostatic weighing demo. So we talked about this last week. The goal is to determine and track the body composition and create body composition goals. So this week we'll mainly be focusing on aiding and setting a body composition goal, looking at the ACSM reference tables and determining whether we are, my client is at a good, fair, or poor body composition, uh, body fat percentage according to their gender and their age, and aid in setting a SMART goal, right? A reasonable, measurable, uh, attainable body composition goal. So these were all the body composition techniques that we used, the circumferences, skin folds, um, bod pod, the in-body biological impedance, and we'll be performing a hydrostatic weighing demo as well. So let's talk about a little bit for body mass index, that's BMI. That's your body weight in kilograms divided by the height in, in meters squared. So high or low BMI can indicate increased morbidity and mortality risk. And the correlation between BMI and percent body fat is approximately 0.7. And this um, is a um, very um, high correlation, meaning the error for estimating body fat from BMI is too high for practical use. So for instance, we calculate BMI and we want to estimate percentage of body fat. It's not gonna be very practical. It's not gonna be very precise, very accurate because there's going to be a very high error, right? Up to plus or minus 5% body fat. That's a very high percentage error. So it's not gonna be a good um, BMI. It's not gonna be a good tool for us to estimate percentage of body fat. And the main reason why is because it fails to distinguish between body fat, muscle mass, or bone, right? So we, we've probably seen this example before. If I have uh, two clients, one client is a sedentary person and my second client is a bodybuilder. Both of them have the same weight, as you can see, sedentary person, their body weight is 285 pounds. The bodybuilder is also 285 pounds. The size, right, they, uh, their height is the same, six feet eight, and the BMI is the same. It's 30.8. So as you can see, based on height and their weight, their BMI is the same, but they have significantly different percentage of body fat and percentage of muscle, right? One individual is leaner compared to the other, other individual whose body fat is, uh, is higher and the percentage of muscle mass is lower. So BMI is a overall good tool to use, but it's not gonna be very indicative of percentage of body fat or a good representation uh, rep BMI is not gonna be good representative of body composition. So this is table 3.1 from your ACSM 11th edition. This is a classification of disease risk based on body mass index and a wasted conference. So for today's lab, you'll be uh, calculating the BMI of your lab partner. You'll use this table to rate if they are underweight, Normal, a normal weight, overweight, or at a obesity class. So, for instance, if my client is a female, women, 
their circumference. The waist circumference is less than 88 centimeters. And, their, and I calculate that their BMI was, I don't know, 19 kgs per meter squared. Then my client will be at a normal, normal body weight. And so there is no increased risk of disease. But let's say that my client is a female and I calculate their, that her BMI is, let's say 31 kgms per meter squared. And her waist circumference is over 88 centimeters. That means that my client is going to be at a very high risk of disease based on waist circumference and BMI, right? So again, this is taking into account the waist circumference of my client, the BMI of my client, and from those two measures, I determine this is risk. So in that example, my client, we have a very high risk, but I don't know the body composition, right? Again, BMI does not distinguish between percentage of fat mass, fat-free mass, muscle. So um, take a note of that. So talking about the waist circumference is, uh, waist circumference alone is an indicator of obesity-related health risk. Right, and it, it is superior to BMI because it is a better measure of visceral adiposity. Visceral adiposity is a greater risk for visceral related diseases. Right, that would be the fat mass around the uh, waist and the hips that is around the uh, organs, right? It could be subcutaneous or visceral fat that is. Um, and mostly located in this area, right? So it's going to be a better measure of visceral adiposity and risk for obesity-related diseases. Abdominal obesity is a primary obesity issue, and visceral adiposity is a greater risk for obesity-related diseases. And be aware of anatomical location when you're performing the waist measurement and the hip measurement to be able to be accurate with the disease risk stratification. So this table 3.2 from the ACSM 11th edition, this is the risk criteria for waist circumference in adults. So we perform circumference measurements in class, um, look at the waist circumference that you obtain from the data, that you recorded from your lab partner and look at the risk category, if they are at a high or low uh, risk for obesity related diseases. So for an instance, if my clients are female women and the waist circumference was below 70 centimeters or less than 27.5 inches, then my client is a very at a very low risk for obesity-related diseases. But if my client is a man and the waist circumference that I measured was between 100 and 120 centimeters or 39.5 or 47 inches, then that means that my client is at a high risk for obesity-related diseases. So that is how you use this table 3.2 to um, rate your client's risk for diseases. All right, now let's talk about the bod pod results. The range of error for this test is plus or minus one to 2.7% body fat. So it is a very accurate. Bod pod is an accurate, it's as accurate as hydrostatic weighing um, but compared to hydrostatic weighing, it is quicker and easier to perform. It requires less logistics and you don't get wet, which is nice. Once the subject's mass and volume are determined, 
the body density is calculated and the relative proportions of fat to fat-free mass are determined. All right, so for the test, your body weight was measured, both pounds and kilograms, and then the volume is measured. Volume is measured by you, um, um, by the space that you occupy inside the bar pot. So before we start the test, we do a calibration where the bar pot calibrates to um, just the pod empty, right? No one in there. And then we perform the measures in which you are sitting inside and we close the door and the bar pot does uh, subsequent measures, right? So that difference between the volume of the bar pot empty to you inside um, is used that body mass volume, body volume to calculate body density and then the proportions by mass of fat free mass. So for example, if the interior air volume of the empty chamber is 400 liters and the volume of the chamber is reduced to 350 liters with the subject inside, the body volume of the subject would be 50 liters. And then once we obtain, uh, once the bar pod, um, performs that measure, performs that measure of body volume, then it uses predictive formulas to calculate the body composition and body density. So here are your bot bot results. This is just an example. This is a demo. You have multiple um, results provided here on your sheet. Over here at the top, you have a, a standard deviations, right? And there's it's a there's a distribution. But this individual specifically, the result for the percentage of body fat performed using the bot pod was 17.5%. This standard deviation, the population mean and standard deviation, the results obtained from the literature were used to develop population specific mean and standard deviation values, assuming a normal distribution of the population. Right, these values are shown in the distribution curve and are used in the automatic interpretation. So basically these um, different standard deviations from middle to the left and right, Right here in the middle, we see that on average, on the population for this subject, who is a male, according to my client's gender and age, where the normal body fat percentage would be for that. So again, if my client is male and according to their age, is age 48. For men, this age, the normal body fat percentage value would be uh, approximately, uh, here it says 34% um, body fat. Then over here, it says that my client's body fat percentage was 17.5. Right, so here will be a standard deviation uh, to your right. Over here, you have more results. You have percentage of body fat, fat mass, in kilograms, fat free mass, percentage of fat free mass, the total body mass. That was recorded in kilograms, 89.7, body volume in liters, body density, and thoracic gas volume. In this example, this client also um, um, selected the option of using population uh, specific uh, means 
and standard deviations for individuals who are swimmers. So it's using this data and it's comparing it to this population. The results obtained are compared to this population. Now let's talk about your in-body results. Uh, for the in-body, the measurement is done using a safe, low-level current that is sent through the body, through the hand, and the foot electrodes. The impedance the currents encounter are measured, and from there, your body composition is derived. So the results give you a breakdown of your overall body composition displaying these vital measurements. Total body water divided into into intracellular and extracellular water, lean body mass, dry lean mass, body fat, and weight. So here, your, uh, here are your in-body results. From all this data that it provides you, I want to highlight a couple of things. Over here at the top, you have the body composition analysis. So out of the total weight of this client, that's female age 51, her weight is 130 pounds. And then from there, the in body does a segment analysis, right? Of fat mass and fat free mass, the two compartment model. One compartment is the lean body mass, and the other compartment is um, the um, body fat, right? The fat mass to fat free mass. So let's look at the Let's look into the compartments. Out of the total body weight, body fat mass was 48 pounds. And then the fat free mass is 80, or the lean body mass is 82.2 pounds. And the lean body mass, fat free mass compartment, remember that is also uh, not just the muscle, bone, organs, it's also water. Right? So it does a segment analysis of total body water as well. So from the lean body mass component, it divides it into dry lean mass that in this case, dry lean mass is just muscle and total body water. So dry lean mass excludes the body water. So that total body water is also split into intracellular water and extracellular water. So if you notice from when performing the in-body test and you obtain the results, if you notice an increase in extracellular water, but not in intracellular water, this could be due to an acute inflammation from overtraining. So people who do not maintain normal body water ratios may have an increased lean body mass due to swelling caused by strenuous exercise or activity, right? So a fluctuation in your body water, not so much the dry lean mass, the muscle. Dry lean mass excludes body water. So if your dry lean mass increases, then this is generally a sign that you have gained muscle mass, right? So over time, if we track this dry lean mass component using the in-body, you can see um, if we have um, gained muscle mass. And now if we go down here at the bottom, um, all the other um, results that you get, your weight, right? Skeletal muscle mass, body fat mass, BMI, percentage of body fat, then a segmental lean analysis from uh, that is evaluating, right? Uh, the percentage of uh, muscle in different segments, the right arm, left arm, trunk, right leg, left leg. And over here down on the bottom, um, after a segmental lean analysis, you have the extracellular water, to total body uh, water. This here, if um, when obtaining the results, 
right? A high lean body mass and a high ratio of extracellular water to total body water ratio usually indicates excess body water. So not just muscle, right? So that's why it does this analysis to um, do a comparison of body water to um, dry lean mass, muscle mass. So for today's lab, we're going to be establishing goals. And to establish a goal, we first need to know the percentage of body fat right, that we have obtained using different methods. To study body composition, we're going to know fat mass, fat free mass. Then from there, we're going to use the ACSM reference tables to determine the rating um, based on my client's gender and age, where do they stand on the ACSM tables at a poor or average percentage of body fat. Once I determine that, I'm gonna be able to establish a desirable body mass. That would be a desirable uh, body weight that my client wants to be at and also a goal percentage of body fat of my client if they have a specific goal in mind or I can do a prescription, right? And establish a reasonable attainable percentage of body fat goal for my client based on the results that I obtain using the body composition results, right? So if my client's goal is to lose weight, but they are already at a normal body weight and at a good percentage of body fat, then it's probably a good idea to not decrease that any further, right? They're at a healthy body weight, healthy body fat percentage based on their gender and age. So it doesn't make sense if they still want to lose weight, right? They probably might want to shift their mindset into maybe improving their performance, right? Gaining strength or gaining more cardiovascular fitness. Right, so the establishing a desirable body mass goal and percentage of body fat should be um, reasonable, like specific, attainable, and you as a professional, you have to prescribe a reasonable goal that makes sense, not just for the um, your client's specific goals and desires, but also what makes sense and will be a smart goal to do. So here are the ACSM tables. These are the same ones from the 11th edition. These are the 10th edition ACSM tables. These are the fitness categories for body composition for men and for women. These are also posted on cameras for you to see. So the way that we can classify our lab partners or our clients, right? If my client is a female age between 20 and 29, and from the test that I performed, either skin folds or the bot bot or the in body, I obtained that it was at 22% body fat, then my client is at a fair rating at about 45 percentile, right? So that would be a fair body composition, a percentage of body fat. So if my client wants to improve body fat percentage, maybe lose some weight, then it would be reasonable to do that uh, uh, category of improvement of one level. So for instance, if I want to suggest my client to improve their body fat percentage, then I will select a one category improvement from fair to good. So I would be, for instance, 22.2% to any of these uh, percentages up here in the good category, okay? So if I want to do it as so that it is uh, specifically a one category of improvement, it will be from 22.2 to 19% body fat. And for instance, if my client's a female between the ages 20 and 29, and she's at 11.4% body fat, she's very lean, and she wish, wishes to lose weight uh, further, right? She's already at a very good 
um, fitness category, right? So it wouldn't make sense if I um, recommend even further improvements in body composition. Obviously it depends, right? If you have a, a bodybuilder and they wish to further improve their percentage of body fat and body composition, then you have to take further steps. Right? For, but for the general population, uh, be aware of this on the ratings where your client stands in based on their gender and age and then creating smart attainable goals. So here's an example calculation uh, for the subjects, female, 20 years old, the body weight's 121 pounds. And then I have this uh, data collected, body fat percentage is 24%. And my client's desired body fat percentage goal is 20%. So this is a one level of improvement here. So if I go back and look at my table, right? My client's body fat percentage was 24% and one category of improvement will be from 24 to 20% body fat from poor to fair. That goal is reasonable, right? And attainable. If I select a goal, from instance, from 24 to 15% body fat. Um, this might take a much longer time to reach than if it, it will be just one category of improvement, right? So I wanna make my goal setting realistic. I don't wanna make it unrealistic. Well, I'll have my client with a big goal and not without the and not have the necessary steps to get to that goal, right? So small goals are better than bigger goals, right? Chunk it up, can chunk it up into small pieces so you can make um, goals more attainable and reasonable. So an example calculation here, my client's desired body fat is 20%, right? And I use that one level of one category of improvement using the ACSM tables. I use these formulas that are in your lab manual, right, to calculate fat mass and fat free mass. Make sure that you're calculating that in kilograms. So once I calculated fat mass of my client, I use this formula, which is body mass, kilograms times the percentage of body fat of my client is 24% divided by 100 that gives me the fat mass using the two compartment model, right? Fat mass to fat free mass. It comes out to be 13.2 kilograms. For fat free mass, that will be the um, body mass divided, sorry, excuse me, minus the fat mass, that will be 41.8 kilograms. Now, if I want to calculate desired body mass using the desired body fat percentage that my client wants to reach, that's 20%. That would be the fat free mass component, 41.8 kilograms divided by one minus 20 divided by 100. That would give me 52.25 kilograms, right? So if my client is currently 55 kilograms, 24% body fat and her goal is to go down to 20%, that would be, she would, her desired body mass would be 52.25 kilograms at 20% body fat. Talked about this last week, but this is your skin fold template. Once you recorded the data, you put it in on the green boxes, you select coefficients A and B, so it can do the calculations for you and calculate body density, percentage of body fat, fat mass, fat feet mass. Using this table, the two component model formulas for estimating body fat from body density. Right? Coefficient A will be this first value, coefficient B will be the second value. So once you completed the skin fold template, input the coefficients A and B according to population, age, and gender. 
So for instance, if my client is a male between the ages of 18 and 59, I'll come here to this percentage of body fat formula and select coefficient A to be 4.95 and coefficient B 4.5, which are these values here. Last but not least, for your lab manual, you will be filling out the results for body circumference, all the circumferences that you collected, you input the data there, you will select risk category using the reference table the ACSM, input the body composition results for the skin folds, the bioelectrical impedance and pod pod, use the pod pod metrics, input the data there, do the lab manual analyses where you uh, indicate, right, if they, your client is at a no risk or increased risk for obesity-related diseases and so on. And the discussion that would be the goal setting. So according to the previous health risk assessments, we'll answer the following question. Right? You'll establish a specific body fat percent and body mass goal for your client using the ACSM tables that we talked about. And please be specific. Right? You're going to do a brief description of what that goal for your client is, and then you will complete the table. The table, just select the appropriate uh, options that reflect your client's goal. So, for here, section one, so all, input desired body fat percent, desired body mass, desired lean body muscle mass. And then you would choose one. If your client's is weight loss, you'll select and fill out this box. If your client's goal is to gain weight, then you will fill out this box only. Or if your client's goal is to maintain their weight, you'll select this box and answer this one only. And on the last part, you would choose one as well. So if your client's goal was to lose weight, then calculating the total calories and fat mass to lose. If your client's goal was to gain weight, you'll calculate the total calories and lean body mass to gain. And if your client's was, goal was to maintain their weight, you would just input the maintenance calories, the total daily, daily energy expenditure of your client to uh, maintain their weight. There are example calculations on Canvas that you can reference to to help you in creating your goal and also doing the calculations. So for lab six, you will turn in two documents, lab six table, the skin folds, that is the Excel template, and then the results section that it's in a Word doc or PDF.